So as I was saying, at about the same time that I was asked to speak, I happened to chance upon this article. I've, ex I've taken a picture from that. And, you know, in this, I sort, sort of saw some keywords that lit me up, things that I understood. Uh, I've uh, shaded this, the Auslander books form formula, and also the fact that someone here, uh, Diamond is saying he needed to learn more commutative algebra and the word Bruns and Hudzog. And also further down in the page, uh, in the same page, you see this footnote where, uh, you know, I've, I've, again, I've highlighted this. I, I'll let you read it for yourself, where uh, the author is saying that somehow perhaps some commutative algebra would be helpful in the theory of Shimura variety. So I felt, okay, maybe I have a, something to say to this audience. Uh, so before I start saying, can anybody guess which article this is from? Indeed, indeed, it's Frank's. And I, I, then I, was, I thought at least one person in the audience would be interested in what I'm saying if I put this out. But <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. So I'll, I'll start talking. I'll, I'll, I'll begin the talk with some, giving you some background, which uh, comes from the work of uh, Andrew Wiles and Fred Diamond. And the next uh, two bits are some bits of commutative algebra, so sort of the main part of the talk, and then some applications to number theory. And time permitting, I'll return to this subject of congruence modules and uh, say a bit more about the commutative algebra behind it. Okay, and the references for this, uh, these uh, four papers that are you can find on the archive, and uh, you can ignore them for now. The main thing is that more than anything, I learned it, learned what I know from my co-authors, two of whom are in the audience. I'm sorry that the picture of Jeff isn't that great, but the original is here, so you can look at him. <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, and of course, you know that this is just the references that I'm. Uh, for the talk, but this is building on work of many people, many of who are in the audience, and I'm putting this up to, uh, you know, so that some, as, I was, as I was going to talk about something which is not entirely my territory, and I'm only saying something which I only superficially understand. So please humor me, but also if you find something egregious, don't hesitate to chime in. Don't interrupt, that's not allowed. But you're <laughs> allowed to chime in, and you know, that, and I, I also say that to my co-authors. What is that? Respectfully. <laughs> Respectfully. Okay. So let me begin at the beginning, or for me anyway. It's the work of Wiles and Diamond. And it's really something I picked up from Diamond's Multiplicity One paper. So the, uh, the, the it seems the main step in the modularity theorem, so he reduces this to proving that a certain surjective map of commutative Noetherian local rings, uh, we, and uh, where here the maps are R to T, which I gather is traditional. R is some Galois deformation ring, T is uh, some ring of uh, some Hecke algebra, and there are some constraints which are dictated by sigma. And the goal is to prove that this map is an isomorphism. That's sort of the main step in the proof. And okay, so. And the strategy is to, uh, again, I'm building off the paper of Diamond. The strategy is that there is a module over the Hecke algebra, which I'm going to call M sigma, the Hecke module. And however it comes, the goal is it suffices to prove that this is faithful as a module over the deformation ring R sigma. Because then if it's faithful, the kernel of the map of rings is in the annihilator of the module. Because it's faithful, it's zero. So you know that the kernel is zero, so it's an isomorphism sort of a simple thing. But in fact, uh, uh, it's easier to prove or it suffices to prove. Faithful is what you want, but it suffices to prove that it is in fact free, which is of course a stronger condition. And this is what is done in the work of Diamond and Weiss, right? So the mod so a certain module over the Hecke algebra is free as a module over the deformation ring. So it must be that R equal to T, or R sigma is T sigma. Uh, I'll just make a comment here that it's enough to prove, you don't have to prove that M is uh, free, it's enough to prove that it has a free sum out, because then you would get the same conclusion. And this becomes important later. I'll bring it up when it does. Uh, so I also want to note that from this point down, the, uh, the algebra of Hecke operators plays no role. It's mostly the deformation ring and the action on M sigma that matters, okay? Okay, so this, uh, the way they, uh, Viles and Diamond tackle this is to build it, uh, do it in two cases. First is the minimal case, which is 
there are no conditions on sigma. And then you have the, the idea is to use something called the Taylor Wiles patching, where you construct uh, rings and a uh, ring R's infinity, which I call R infinity, and a module over the ring M infinity, where uh, this patching method, what happens in this process is that, so R is going to be a quotient by some ideal in R infinity, and then M is the quotient by the same ideal. So it's enough to prove that M infinity is free as an R infinity module, right? And the good thing that happens here is that after you patch, R infinity is a regular local ring, and M infinity is something called a maximal cohen macaulay module. Yeah. I'll get back to this. If you haven't heard about this, I'll get back to it later. But this is where the auslander bookspawn equality kicks in. It tells you that if you have a maximal cohen macaulay module over a regular ring, it's free. So it's just some bit of commutative algebra. This is where it enters in his work. So M infinity is free as an R infinity module. So M is free as an R module, right? So actually in their work, in the, in the diamond Wiles context, you get more that the ideal by which you're quotienting is not any old ideal, but uh, generated by a regular sequence. So the deformation ring turns out to be a complete intersection. And this is important in the next step when you, in the passage from the minimal to the non-minimal context, right? So the general case, and the idea is to, you care about freeness, but somehow uh, they're only able to uh, carry together both freeness and the CI property of the ring. So this is what is done. You're going from minimal case to the non-minimal case and you're, you're propagating the complete intersection and the freeness property. And to this end, so Wiles introduces an invariant, and uh, I, I want to introduce this invariant slightly more generally. So let's say we have a complete local O algebra. O is some uh, uh, some local ring, complete local ring, and it, that's not really important, but it's a DVR that's important. And you're fixing an augmentation, a surjective map to O, all right? And uh, so the key hypothesis here is that when you localize R at this kernel of this uh, augmentation, which I'm calling P, the ring is, it's a field. So it's a minimal prime. P is a minimal prime. Not only that, when you localize at P, it's a, it's a field. So there are no nil potents there. Okay, and this can be phrased in terms of what's called the co noble module of the map to O. That's P mod P square, and that's supposed to have finite length as an O module, right? So and now you, you fix an R module M. So you should, you're supposed to think of R as being R infinite, R sigma and M as being N sigma. But, okay, and so in this, in their context, M will be finite flat over O. And then uh, Diamond introduces something called the congruence module of M to be this quotient of the module M. So here, uh, so there is P of course is the prime ideal, which is the kernel of this map. I is the annihilator of uh, P in R. So it's some ideal in R. And this is the P torsion part of M and this is the I torsion part of M, okay? Then this is uh, the congruence module and the numerical criteria that plays an important role in this work. It says it's the following. So, so let's assume, I'm assuming for simplicity that M has rank one at P when you localize. So the numerical, the, the statement is that the length of this uh, congruence module, which it, it turns out to have finite length, it's, that's not hard to see. This, is, this length is less than the length of the cotangent module, P mod P square. And when you have equality, R is complete intersection and uh, M is free, right? That's really what they're after. Uh, of course, the interesting thing is that both the congruence module and the cotangent module have number theoretic interpretations uh, in, the, in, in this context. But anyway, this is just a bit of abstract, in some sense, abstract criteria from commutative algebra for detecting complete intersection and freeness. Okay, so how this gets used uh, to go from the minimal to the non-minimal case is through this uh, as follows. So you, everything that I've said applies to R sigma and M sigma, and you're and to go from sigma to sigma prime, where you throw in one more place, yeah, one more valuation is that you have such a diagram. Uh, you have such a diagram here. So the, the, the deformation ring corresponding to sigma prime maps onto the one corresponding to sigma. 
And you also have the corresponding picture at the level of the modules. And the key thing is that they're isomorphic at P. So the difference is only P torsion. And the surjectivity of the map here is coming from something called Iara's lemma, right? Okay, and given this, you can, so one thing Wiles and Diamond both do is you can track the increase. So there is a, given such a picture, you can track the increase of the length of the congruence module as you go from M sigma to M sigma prime. And it's also possible to track the change in the cotangent modules, which is easier. The cotangent module is easier to track. But the, the tracking the length of the congruence module, it uses more structure, which you have available in the number theoretic context, that these modules are self-dual. And from using this, as this already mentioned, using this the, uh, and that uh, diamond Wiles numerical criteria, you can prove that if the rings at the base, uh, R sigma, M sigma, have these desired properties that it's a complete intersection and M sigma is free, then it lifts to sigma prime and M prime, okay? So this is how uh, roughly the community algebra comes into the proof of the modularity in the diamond wines context. Okay, so uh, so moving on. So this was that context. So outside the Wiles context, that some of the problems one encounters is that uh, in all this, that the deformation ring did not be a complete intersection. So this was somehow important because the numerical criteria has inbuilt in it a criteria for CI. The second problem that arises is that there may be no characteristic zero points. So there may be no augmentations to O, which was important in even defining the congruence module, right? And the other issue that comes up is that the defect may be positive. So one has to deal not just with uh, modules over R or M sigma, but complexes M sigma. Okay, so of course, in this time, I gather uh, Marcus then came up with a way to patch not just in the minimal situation. So patching was used in the minimal case to go from some arbitrary rings to something that was regular, but then Mark showed us how to patch in the non-minimal case. And then Caligari Garati also showed us how to patch complexes. So at this point, uh, the, you, you didn't have to worry about dealing with the minimal and the non-minimal case separately, at least as, as far as modularity was concerned. But the caveat here is that although in the minimal case, perhaps the patched rings are still regular, this is not, not necessarily true in the non-minimal case. And I'm told, and Jeff showed me examples where the patched ring is not even Gorenstein, if I'm not mistaken. But although most sometimes it's complete intersection, so that at least is okay. And, uh, because, and one can only deduce in this context, because you're not really dealing with regular rings, what you know is that even if a maximal Cohen-Macaulay modules estimates on the support tell you that it's M is generically free or free after inverting the uniform, uniformizer of the DVR. So that's enough to prove, of course, R equal to T up to torsion or maybe modulo and ideal, but you don't get R equal to T on the nose. This is my understanding of the situation. So what, is, what was missing is a criteria akin to that of Diamond and Wiles that allows you to go from uh, the patch string in the non-minimal situation, a minimal situation to the non-minimal one. Okay, that, so this is what was missing, a criteria that you could apply at the patch level. And the problem is the following. So if you remember, uh, one important step was that the we were measuring lengths of certain modules, the cotangent module and the congruence module, and those had finite length, and that required the kernel of the augmentation to be a minimal prime. And this need not be the case anymore in this after patching. If you look at the augmentation after patching and, and the module is no longer flat. So if you just use the definition as introduced by Wiles and Diamond, then you don't get anything from there. The numbers are not finite, okay? So I, at this point I can summarize, I just built up so, so far to tell you what the rest of the talk is about. You can, it just, the, the, the summary of the rest of the talk is that uh, it, I'm gonna present a talk about a theory of congruence modules that you can apply at the patched level, okay? And more, it's, it's not important that you get those rings from patching and I'll talk about it later. 
And then you can work entirely at the patch level and use, and there are criteria analogous to diamond and vials that you can apply at the patch level to pass from the non-minimal to the uh, minimal to the non-minimal case. Okay, and I will discuss two applications. So two new applications in the number theoretic context where you can prove R equal to T theorems, uh, which were not accessible, I gather, from existing techniques. So everything I'm saying is going to be, uh, is from this paper, this preprint that's uh, on the archive with uh, Shikhar and Jeff. Okay. So the next few slides, sort of the middle part is just pure commutative algebra. Uh, but I should say that uh, somehow there's even the statements of the results, I couldn't have guessed a priori if I had not talked to my collaborators. The, the, the nature of the statements and sometimes even the arguments were suggested by number theory, although it's just pure commutative algebra. And for me anyway, the intuition uh, that I was using to sort of get to this was that the properties of this map. So I'm sp I'm switching uh, uh, of this augmentation R to O are similar to the properties of a map of a local ring to its residue field, roughly. Okay, and indeed, you know, if you start with uh, this map from R to O and localize at the kernel, you land yourself in that situation. But of course, in this process, you're losing information about torsion. So when you localize, some of the trick was to get information not lose torsion information uh, in the process of, in this process. Okay. So, uh, so, th so this is the commutative algebra part. So I should say that, uh, uh, so in fact, this, the commutative algebra could have been done about 20 years ago. There's nothing really, it's fairly close to the ground. There, uh, in fact, most of what I'm gonna say, you might find in Bruns and Herzog, except for two key facts, which I will mention. Yeah. And also, I've assumed some commutative algebra. Of course, I don't know the audience. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to chime. Uh, please bring it up. As I said, most of it is fairly close to the ground. And all the results that I'm using were available at least 10 years ago. OK. So the context is that we have a discrete valuation ring, DVR. And I'll fix a uniformizer. It won't come up much. Uh, pi and the, its k will be the residue field. And I'll, at various points, I'll have to look at the torsion-free quotient of an O module. So you know, so I'm going to use this notation that TORS stands for the torsion part, and the quotient would be uh, denoted this TF subscript. So that is the torsion-free quotient. And, and I'm switching from R to A because, um, you know, yeah, whatever reason. Uh, so we have a, because of course, you know, the, you're applying the construction of the congruence module, not just to the deformation ring, but maybe also to the Hecke algebra itself. So, so it's just some ring A. So we are, it's a complete local A algebra and you're fixing an augmentation uh, like before to O, right? And the class, so I'll write as before P for the kernel of the augmentation. So I'll, and I'll uh, subscript lambda and C will be the height of P lambda. I'm using C, which I might, maybe I should use H, but C is also the co-dimension of the point P in spec R. So that's why the whole title of the paper is coming, the congruence module in higher co-dimensions, right? The classical case is C equal to zero, but I'm not imposing any such constraints here, okay? So, right. And you can assume, uh, it's really, it's basically the kind of rings you're looking at are quotients of power series over O by some ideals and the augmentation is where you're killing the variables. Of course, there are some constraints because I, ah, at, the, at the moment not, but soon I'll put some constraints on this ring uh, on the map lambda. Okay, and we're really interested in the category of pairs um, A to uh, where uh, consisting of this complete local ring O A and the map lambda. Actually, one of the things is that you think of A as being fixed and lambda is something you get to choose. You want to discover something about A or A modules and you can pick various lambda to probe A and M. Hmm? Okay, so, so here's the sort of the thing. You can, you, this map A to O induces a map of O modules. At, and so remember C is the co-dimension of the point. So you have a map at the level of X going from X to OA to X to OO, right? And 
you can then, so these are both O modules and pass, you can look at the torsion free quotients on either side. Okay, so, so you look at the torsion free parts of the source and the target and look at the co kernel of this map. And this is what uh, is the congruence, which we call the congruence module of the ring A. Okay, again, that this is the right thing to do is only after the fact. This is what turns out to do the job that we wanted to do. For c equal to zero, the source of this map is just, you know, x to is nothing but a linear maps from O to A, which is nothing but the P torsion part of A. And the target is just O, it's the endomorphisms of O as an A module, which is just O. So the map in question is nothing but the map from the P torsion part to A. And this is what uh, Viles calls the uh, congruence ideal, eta is what he usually, that he denotes. So the co kernel is the congruence module of a, if c equal to zero, it would be, it coincides with the, co uh, with the congruence module as introduced by Andrew Weiss. Okay, uh, just some language. So uh, going forth, I'll have to talk about various properties holding at the point at lambda, by which I mean that they hold after you localize at lambda, at, at the prime P lambda. So for example, uh, this condition comes up that A is regular at lambda, uh, all I mean is that when you localize A at P, it's a regular local ring. All right. Uh, okay, so here's sort of the starting point of this work get, to get us going. The, this congruence module is, has finite length precisely when the ring A is regular at P. So remember in the Wiles context, when you localized A at P, it was a field. Now here, what you get is a what you want. What you're looking for is a regular local ring. So it's a regular or smooth, smooth or regular point in spec A. Okay, so that's the first thing. So finiteness of the length is basically saying that A is regular at lambda. Secondly, when it is regular, the congruence module is cyclic. This is some saying something about the highest X group. I'll get back to this in a second. And secondly. And this is sort of interesting to say that we are, this may be something that the, we're interested in the length. It's always finite as long as A is regular at P, but it's zero if and only if A is as regular as a ring, you know, at every prime. So this is uh, the result. And the first two parts are really just saying, so, because you know, you want to test finite less of length of some O module and you want to test that it's cyclic so well. Yeah. So you can basically do it after localizing at the prime. So they're really local statements, but the third one is clearly not. You have information at lambda and you're sort of propagating it to all of spec A, that's something. So it's not something you can test locally. And the key input in the proof, so this is one bit of commutative algebra you won't find in Brinson Herzog, is that uh, is this result here, that if you have, oops, uh, uh, hang on a bit. Yeah, this one. So, so let's say we have a Noetherian local ring A, R. So a, R is supposed to be a standard for A localized at P with residue field K. So you can look at this map, which actually comes up in various contexts, not just in local algebra, but also in say rational homotopy theory. It's called the evaluation map, looking from X K R to X K K, right? So it's induced by the red map for, to the residue field. And the key thing is that this map is non-zero. So these X groups live in many degrees, right? In fact, unless the ring is regular, one knows that this each of them, well, this has in, lives in infinitely many degrees and this map is non-zero only if and only if R is regular. Now one direction that when it is regular, this map is non-zero, it's not so hard to check. It was already known to Serre and Ausler and Buxbaum. And the idea is that you know a free resolution of the residue field, namely the Kozil complex. So you can write it down and you're computing cohomology in the top degree, which is clearly subjective. Hmm? But the converse is a bit more involved and that induces something called, ah, that uses something called stable cohomology, the proof, at least the one I remember, which is the one in this one, in this paper. <laughs> Is it uses something called stable cohomology of uh, commuted rings, not even commutative. It's a, it's basically the cohomology theory. If you go to the stable category, meaning the bounded derived category modulo the perfects. I mean, after a ser, we know that the ring is regular 
if and only if the residue field is, has finite free resolution. So then, of course, a natural thing is to see what happens if you kill the perfect complexes in the derived category. You get something called the singularity category or the stable derived category. And the cohomology theory there is what is called stable cohomology. So the proof of this fact uses stable cohomology and the structure of the target XT algebra. Now, the, typically, the XT algebra is uh, it's humongous, except when the ring, ring is regular. But what it has going for it is it, it's a graded Hopf algebra with divided power. So there's a struct, there's a poincare burkhoff with theorem for it, which tells you that uh, there are that has there's no torsion with respect to the maximal ideal. And that's the key in proving this statement. Anyway, you can accept this is the only bit of commutative algebra you won't see. One bit of commutative algebra you won't find in Brunson Herzog. But anyway, this is key to understanding this why this map is non-zero. I should say for for much of these for to prove one and two, you only need the easy direction. It's for the convert for the part three that you need the converse. Okay. Anyway, let's move on. So from now on, I'm going to assume I won't repeat this hypothesis. The ring A is regular at lambda. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now let's uh, I want to introduce congruence modules for any coefficients. So let's take M to be a module. And for simplicity, let me assume that the module has sufficient depth. But so I mean, so C plus one. Remember, C is the height of the prime, height of lambda, co-dimension of lambda, and this is equal to some vanishing of x. That the x, this x group vanishes up to uh, degree C. So, and this has two implications: that the x group which will turn out to be important, this vanishes up to degree C minus one, and also that M is free at lambda. So already that condition on depth has this, uh, and this uses the Auslander books form again. For most applications, if you wish, you could also assume the ring is called Macaulay, uh, so which means that the depth of the ring itself is the depth dimension of A, and then the conditions I'm imposing on the module are saying that it's a maximal cone Macaulay module. This is what it means that its depth is equal to the dimension of the ring. But this is not important. But the conditions of M are important on the module. Okay. But as I said, there are situations where the ring is not cohen macaulay even. So this is um, yeah, useful to keep in mind. OK. So then the congruence module of M is defined along very similar lines. You look at this, you know, the similar X modules. So, you know, you, there is a map from M to uh, o tensor M, which is M mod PM. And that induces a map at the level of X. You look at the torsion-free quotients, and the co-kernel is what is the congruence module of M. Okay. So maybe one comment is in order. It might seem odd that I'm dealing with, you know, derived functors, but I've thrown in something which is non-derived here. But in fact, you know, it's okay. you can actually take also the derived tensor product here, and that won't change the answer, but that requires a bit of an argument because the, all the higher tor groups have torsion and that gets you can that gets ignored when you take the torsion free quotients. So it is uh, the right definition, at least from homological algebra point of view. Okay. And because I'm assuming that the ring is regular, it's not hard to check that these congruence modules have finite length. Okay, so this is the congruence module. The definition is fairly elementary. And of, co of course, the, the trouble is to deal with these, uh, to prove any properties of this. So let me uh, talk about a few key properties that are, you know, that make it a viable uh, thing to work with. So the first thing is something called invariance of domain, which we call invariance of domain. And the context is, suppose you have a map of rings. So we have the A and M. And suppose you have a map of rings A prime to O in this category, which means exactly that you have such a commutative diagram. And uh, they, there's, <clears throat> they only differ up to torsion in the sense that when you localize at the prime ideal, the relevant prime ideal, they become isomorphic. So therefore, they also they have the same co-dimension, the points of the same co-dimension. So in this case, uh, it doesn't matter if you compute so remember the congruence module was an A module, 
So you could compute the congruence module of M as an A module or as an A prime module, and they are the same. They're isomorphic, not just the same length, which is uh, which sort of was, uh, when I first saw it, it was a bit surprising to me because the it involves X groups and X groups are notoriously not, uh, you know, they change when you go, when you change rings. It's, so this behavior is more like local cohomology than X, but. Of what? Little c. Ah, the height of the prime, height of the kernel. Ah, so I could write it up. So maybe it's, yeah. So little c is the height of this kernel of the map from A to O. But ah, so this is why I'm assuming that it's an isomorphism at the prime. So it will turn out to be the same. At lambda, so C is the height of the prime. The height of the prime is the cruel dimension of A. Remember, I'm assuming that they're, they're regular at the prime, right? Yeah, maybe just about one. But at the prime, P prime, it's the same. They're isomorphic, right? You can pick up, yeah. C is the cruel dimension of the local ring. So the local rings are isomorphic. So the C. Maybe you're assuming the No, 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 no. You don't need any. Look, the C is just the cruel dimension of this local ring. Since I'm assuming they're isomorphic, they have the same cruel dimension. Oh, oh. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So the second important property that comes up is if you, you cut down by, you can track what happens when you cut down by a non-zero divisor on M. And this is what this slide is trying to explain. So, so we have this lambda and M as before. When you're fixing a p a element in the kernel p lambda, and because you want to stay in the category where rings are regular when you localize at p, you have to pick something in which is not in what's called a second symbolic power, which is basically that you don't when you look at the image in the localization, you don't want it to be in the square of the maximal ideal. So when you cut down by the element and you localize, you still get a regular ring. And so, and the, the key thing, uh, the second important thing, it's a non-zero divisor. It's not a zero divisor on M. So I'm not assuming F is a not a zero divisor on A, only on M. This is sort of a small thing, but it's important. So then lambda faxes through the quotient and you get lambda bar. Uh, this is what I was saying that the first condition that it's not in the second symbolic power is tantamount to saying that it's regular at uh, the lambda bar. And then it's also the dimension dropped exactly by one. And then the theorem is that you can track the change in the congruence module when you go from one to the other. So remember, this sort of results were important because you want to, you know, you'll see where it comes up. So you can track the increase in the length. So the length of the congruence module of M bar, it grows up by a certain amount, which is precisely the order of the element F. And by order, I mean, I can give a, intrinsic definition, but roughly speaking, you know, if you, you can write this as some power of the uniformizer times the generator of P, one of the generators of P, and you're just picking out this. Uh, so that's the order of F. Okay, so you can track the length. That's the takeaway. That's the, you can track the change in the congruence module. That's the takeaway from this. Okay, and then of course, the other ingredient that is comes up is a cotangent module. And remember, again, we have a map of O algebras regular at lambda. So if you look at, you know, it's always a DVR. So the conormal module P mod P square has a free part and a torsion part. And, uh, and this is, again, because the regularity hypothesis tells you that this must be the height of P lambda. Okay, C is the height. Okay, so what you're interested in is only the torsion. So for now, the torsion part of this conormal module which uh, slight abuse of language I'll speak of as a cotangent module at land, just the torsion part. The, tors the free part also plays a role, and actually it's important in understanding the structure of X algebra. I'll come back to it later. Okay, but for now, let's focus on the torsion part. Okay, and then, so this is the cotangent module is easy to compute. And, uh, you know, so you can write A as a quotient as we did before, so express F as a sum. I'll give 30 seconds, Matt, the chance to see that the indexing is okay. <laughs> and then you have a presentation like so, and you know you can compute the 
the cotangent model is easy to compute. It's always the congruence model, which is harder because you're computing some X groups. It's some, uh, describe it, okay. So what we're interested in is the difference between the cotangent module and the congruence module, the lens, and that's something that's called the widest defect. So as I said, you know, the hypothesis I imposed on M that it has sufficient depth implies that it is free at lambda. So it has some rank, say mu. So, uh, and then this number, which is the some scaling of the co uh, cotangent module of A minus the length of the congruence module of M is what is the Wiles defect. So in the in the diamond Wiles context, this uh, rank was one. So I kind of ignored it, that, or at least I assumed that it was one. So I ignored that. So the Wiles defect of the ring is just the difference of the cotangent module minus the co and the congruence module. And this is an important uh, property of this invariant that if you go modulo F as before, which is a non-zero divisor on M, the defect doesn't change. Remember I told you that the congruence module changes. It, it so happens that the congruence module and the cotangent module change by the same amount. Uh, that's a key property, so the defect doesn't change. So what it means is that, uh, Ah, so the, for the to check this is where you need to know, we you know uh, to check this property you need to know this invariance of domain, and the pro change of how the congruence modules changes under deformations. So one thing you could do, uh, one consequence of this is that you can, if you want to compute the defect, you could cut down by a regular sequence and get yourself down to the classical situation c equal to zero. And then it's easy to see that the defect is positive. So a priori, it was, it's not clear. I took a difference of two integers. It's not clear it has to be positive. But because you could go down to the, you know, you have this deformation invariance, you get down to this corollary that the defect is positive. And as I say, I, only, I, I think, I don't think we bothered to find counter examples, but this is not going to be true outside the uh, defect uh, sufficient depth case. Okay. So the other thing that, so one important property is this uh, invariance of under deformations. The other important property is here. So we have this QNET map, you know, from this X groups. The X groups should all be familiar because these were involved in defining the congruence module. So we have this QNET map. And uh, so let's look at the map induced at the level of torsion-free quotients. And uh, what we have, so this, the, let me call this map kappa for Q, K for Q. It depends on lambda because it comes, the map from O to A comes up here. So there is, one has this formula that the defect of the module <coughs> is, is some scaling of the defect of the ring plus the length of the co-kernel of this map at the level of the torsion free quotients. Okay. Now, uh, both as a, I'll, I'll uh, talk about this in a second. So both these numbers are positive. So this formula is ba basically saying that the defect, the contributions of defect of M come from two sources. One, the defect in the ring itself, and the other is from this QNET map. So it, in particular, the defect will be zero precisely when this is zero and the co-kernel is zero. So it, and this sort of explains why all along we were able. We were only tracking two properties together, the CI. Uh, so the this uh, uh, the, the last sentence is that a typo? Is, is that a typo? Fact zero. Ah, uh, that not the map is zero, but the length yeah, is zero. Yeah, good, good, I, good, good. I was wondering. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's just that the length of this coconut is zero, not that the map is zero. Yeah. In fact, the map is totally not zero inside. <laughs> yes, that's explanation. Okay. Uh, a proof. I was told growing up that every talk has to have a proof and a joke. Mm -hmm. This is my proof. I hope it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> the proof is not difficult, which is also why I'm proving it. But it's sort of, uh, the thing is, you know, we are interested in uh, the math at the, level of the, at the level of X. And just from functoriality, you have this diagram where on the top you see uh, this X groups. This is the map for the ring. Uh, and you're tensoring up with these uh, pieces, the torsion free pieces, and then we have this map. The, this is the QNET map, and this is an isomorphism because you're just moving a few. Uh, this is a free O module, and you're moving it inside the X, which you can. 
right? But the interesting thing is that the, the map on the top is basically the one that measures the congruence module of A tagged on with this, uh, this free part. And the map on the bottom is the one that measures the congruence module of M. And this is where this thing is coming from because the co-kernel of this is the length of the co-kernel of this, which is uh, this length plus the length of the co-kernel of this, which is uh, uh, M, okay? Oh, that's for the congruence module. So, but when you throw in, when you compute the defects, when you throw in the contribution from the cotangent module, you see this, it's uh, the main reason I put the proof in is to pay the debt to what I learned, that's all. <laughs> okay, so what about the numerical criteria then? So, so we have this, now this congruence module and the cotangent module, and they do what they were supposed intended to do. So first of all, assuming the ring has sufficient depth, the defect of the ring is zero precisely when it's complete intersection. Okay. And any complete intersection ring is Gorenstein, uh, if uh, whatever that means. And then we have a criteria for free sum on. So suppose uh, you, the ring is Gorenstein, and let's say we have a finitely generated module of sufficient depth, right? Now, remember that the, um, the defect of the module was some scaling of the defect of the ring plus some contribution from the QNIT map. But if, so if the defect of the module is, is equal to the defect of the ring up to this factor mu, this happens if and only if M uh, free, uh, uh, M is a, a free module tagged on with something that is not supported at lambda. Mm -hmm. So this is the criteria for a free summons. So this condition is exactly saying that the QNIT map is zero, or no, sorry, is on two, right? And that QNIT map, by the way, is also again connected to this stable cohomology that I mentioned before. It's if you, there's a long exact sequence that comes up, there are three cohomology theories involved and the QNIT map is, comes up in one of them. So, so this is the criteria for free summons. That the diff, and this applies to any Gorenstein ring. You don't need the ring to be CI at this point, right? And actually the, this, the Gorenstein property is much weaker than the CI property. This is something one understands. So we have this criteria for free summons for uh, modules over Gorenstein rings. Although we haven't found a use just for this as yet. Okay, and this, uh, this fact that uh, if you can split off a free module, you can, you can prove using growth and leaks local duality. You can also do it by cutting it down to C equal to zero and doing an ad hoc argument, but there's also an argument that does it on the nose. And this is where the Gorenstein property comes in. Growth, uh, local duality tells you, uh, I mean, Gorenstein means they have local duality and you can do this. Okay, and what I was after was this corollary that uh, if the defect is zero, then of course, first of all, if the defect is zero, as I said, it forces uh, uh, this property to hold and it also forces the defect of A to be zero. Then you get that A is complete intersection and M has a free summer, just like in the diamond Wiles case. Except that it's not quite a corollary because uh, you know, in this result, I had the hypothesis that the depth of A is positive. So there is some argument to be non-trivial, some argument to be made uh, that needs to be done. So it's not an immediate corollary of these two. Let me say it like that. You need to do some arguments because the depth is not given. You don't know a priori that A has enough depth and somehow you have to make the argument for that. Okay, it's maybe only it's something that would excite a or interest the community. So that sort of wraps up the, num the pure commutative algebra part for now. And I promised that there would be two uh, new R equal to T theorems. And this is the first one. Again, this is where you should humor me if I make some mistakes, but I have co-authors in the audience who let me know. So you're fixing some ring of integers in some finite extension of ZL. L is supposed to be a prime number, uh, first for me, but there you go. And uh, F is some imaginary quadratic field in which L does not ramify, and you're fixing, uh, this all this should be familiar to, uh, to this audience, that you're fixing a Bianchi threefold, and a Hecke algebra acting faithfully on the first Betty cohomology of uh, <laughs> And you're fixed, oops. Ah, let me just write it. Uh, 
So we are fixing a representation of the Galois group of F, where M is some suitable non Eisenstein ideal of the Hecke algebra. And you're assuming that this is absolutely irreducible and that you're also fixing a finite set of places in F and with some restrictions that I bet you're more familiar with than I am. Okay. And then you have these corresponding deformation rings and the Hecke algebra uh, uh, at sigma. And the complications here, as I mentioned before, is that the rings involved need not be commutative sections. It could happen that both these are entirely torsion, so you may not have these augmentations to help, uh, you know, so that you, that you, you can't use the Weil's, diamond Wiles criteria. As, oh, this is also a problem that these are both non-zero and can have torsion, so it's not clear how to define congruence modules in this setting. But as I was saying, that was the whole point of defining these things. Um, so one can, we have this at the patch level. So what we get is a result like so, assuming certain standard conjectures, there exists uh, uh, an integer mu, which is the rank of this free module, uh, as such that the homology group localized at M is a free module plus something supported away from uh, uh, plus some other component. But this is good enough for us to deduce that the map R to T is an isomorphism, just like in the Wiles case. As soon as you know that you have a module over uh, the Hecke algebra that is faithful over the defam or which which is which has a free summand as a module over the deformation ring, you know that this must be an isomorphism. So the application is a standard one, and the and the thing is you can run the same proof because you can first patch and then use the num the, the numerical criteria that we have now that you can apply at the patch level. Right, to propagate thing information from the minimal to the non-minimal case. Okay. And uh, I say, oh yeah, I, this is a comment that I, I said standard conjectures and these conjectures have to do with the existence of uh, and properties of these Galva representations and how they change when you go from uh, one sigma, sigma to sigma prime. So Ihara's lemma is one such thing that comes in here, some analog of Ihara's lemma. Okay, so this is what I was saying that the proof is just to patch and work entirely at the patch level and then descend down to uh, the original data. So once again, at the minimal level, it's regular. So you have the starting point, so you can run the Wiles machine and then you have this new numerical criteria to run the proof. Okay, and uh, here's a corollary with the setting as above. If you have any representation of the Galva group uh, like so, then this corresponds to an eigenclass. So there is some uh, modularity result in this context. Okay, so I'm just skimming through this A because I gather this is all familiar to the audience. B because it's not so familiar to me. What is, what is that? Yes. So R is not, right? Because you're going, R is some quotient of R infinity that ideal need not be a regular sequence. So R infinity will be CI, but R itself need not be, but it, we don't care because M infinity is free as an R infinity module and you're going modulo some ideal. So it's, yeah. In fact, there, there are examples where it won't be CI, R and, yeah. And the other, uh, so there it was, that first application was conditional to some conjectures, but this one is an unconditional application. So let me just maybe even put down. So again, you, you start with an indefinite quaternionic algebra and uh, over, the, over the rationals ramified at some finite set of primes uh, indexed by D. And you look at the associated Shimura curve and the uh, residual Galva representation. And once again, uh, so it's all notation you can, once again, using the same patching technique, patching and applying the numerical criteria, one can prove that this map is an isomorphism. Okay. So again, I'm, as I said, I'm skimming through this because this is, I gather, is familiar to the audience. Once you know that there is a, um, there is a criteria you can use at the patch level, all this is standard. Now, in the remaining few minutes, let me go back and say, I, I said, uh, that there were two bits of commutative algebra that is maybe non-standard. I want to bring up the second bit. So it again has to do with this X group, structure of the X algebra. So the key result here, so remember when we define the 
congruence module, let's forget about M for now, because we know that anyway, if you want to understand the congruence or defect for M, you really also, uh, the contribution comes from A and some QNET map. So let's, when you look at the congruence module for A, the target is this X, X module, X to OO at C, but the torsion free quotient. So it turns out that the, this whole X, you know, X itself is an algebra. It's a algebra. It turns out that if you look at the torsion free quotient, it's just the exterior algebra on uh, this dual of the co uh, conormal module. Okay. And this, the X algebra, if it, before you take the torsion free quotient, this can be high, this is typically highly non commutative and it will be infinite unless the ring is regular. Right. And uh, you should compare this result with uh, this, re which the following result, which is again goes back, which probably you can probably find in Seth's book in local algebra, or at least the Tor version, that if you have a regular local ring with residue field K, the X algebra of the residue field is an exterior algebra on the Zariski tangent space. Is this is the Zariski tangent space in this context, right? And of course, this uh, as, uh, this is coming goes back to Ser, and this result implies that this holds after you invert the uniformizer. But of course, you lose a lot of information. Yeah, it doesn't give you information about the torsion. So, but that's not good enough because. After localization, it's clear that you get an isomorphism, but it's sort of interesting that you get it already on the nose. And what goes into this is the following that uh, you, you remember the cotangent module had two components, the torsion free part. So the free part, which we ignored until now. And then there was the torsion part, which came up in the definition of the congruence module. So the free part, it generates, a, it gives rise to a free subalgebra of the X algebra. And where is this coming from? Well, there is this result that if you have a quotient, this is again, completely general, that if you have a quotient of one co quotient map of commutative rings and the co-normal module of this map, so I mean, I mod I square splits as a free module plus something, then the X algebra itself splits into an exterior algebra on uh, a free module of the corresponding rank. Plus uh, this, this is just reminding me that it's generators in degree minus one, homological degree minus one, and then some free algebra from algebra E. Okay, so free summons in this conormal module give you splittings of the algebra splittings of the X algebra. This is somehow key to, yeah. And this is some computation using uh, DG algebras, which by chance, I bring it up because somehow everywhere Tate shows up. <laughs> Even in uh, Wiles's work, the forward and the reverse direction, you were using Tate's work and it shows up here. And curiously, stable cohomology in the context of Gorenstein rings is called Tate cohomology because it's Tate cohomology for group algebra. <laughs> so Tate is everywhere. What next? Yeah, I was debating whether I should suppress the slide, but <laughs> okay. So, so the, the, the three things I wanted to bring up. So there is some connection, it seems, to Euler systems. So the thing is, you know, the congruence module of A is the co-kernel of this map from X O to this target. Oh, oh yeah. So that which is the seat exterior power of X one. The the dual of the cotangent module is just X one. And this is just some Galois cohomology group in the number theoretic context, right? So this is giving you some class. Also, for, in particular, if it takes say C equal to one, you're getting a class in Galois cohomology. The congruence module really is coming from a class in Galois cohomology. And that seems to be an interesting connection, which we haven't quite explored yet. We know this much. I don't know if you want to say anything more. <laughs> Yeah, it's the base class of the Euler system. So it somehow seems to be giving this. So this is, uh, so here, you know, when, when it's applying A, it is not in the patch context, but to some classical deformation ring, uh, Hida deformation ring or something. That's it. Yes. Uh, uh, no, no, I, yeah. Some, I guess. Do you want to speak to that? Oh. Later. <laughs> okay. 
The second thing is, um, you know, there is this work of Galatians and Venkatesh where they introduced uh, derived deformation rings. So the, def the definition we have one has for these congruence modules is fairly elementary and therefore robust. You can carry over to this context. And that's the other thing that seems worth exploring. And that's something we're looking into because the, there's, there's an obvious definition you can make. There is some subtlety about knowing what augmentations to pick because now you're no longer just dealing with rings, but you know, simplicial rings and what is the point is not entirely clear to me. So that's the other thing that's uh, part of what next. I don't have an answer. The last thing, which is maybe, uh, so I said uh, I said the first thing that uh, in the Diamond Wiles context, somehow it was everything was tied up with CI, CI plus freeness. At least we have gotten to Gordenstein. We have gotten over past the CI bit, but there are interesting examples where the deformation ring and even the patch ring is only Cohen Macaulay and not Gorenstein. And one would like to know if there are criteria for freeness or free summons or something which doesn't involve the CI property. And I, at the moment, I, I have no clue. Okay. And that's a good place to stop. Thank you for your attention. So, any any questions for the speaker? So, so it seems that there's an input is that at minimal level. Some yeah. So yeah if, at, at minimal level, you should be. Yeah. So you have just like in the wilds context, you have a criteria for propagating things. So, but you need somewhere to. Yeah, I, yeah. Again, we have all, well, yeah. Well, in some sense, we have this criteria for free summon, right? Maybe at the minimal level, if it's Gorenstein and you know something about the defect being the defect of the ring, you still get the free summon. So you don't really need regular in that sense. <laughs>